Good morning. A special welcome to all of you who are visiting St. Teresa's. Today we celebrate the third Sunday in Ordinary Time. Please stand and join in our open. Oh, please stand and join in our opening song. All are welcome. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, the Lord be with you. And a welcome to all who are here and to those who are uh, hopefully live streaming. We are here as a church, um, alive in prayer and in worship. And Jesus unrolls a scroll in the synagogue, and in a sense, he comes out of himself and he announces his mission. It's his first major public homily. And it's a beautiful call, a summons, to come out of ourselves and to go out into the peripheries of the world and society and to bring them into the parish of the church. So we gather as the church, the people of God, filled with the spirit, the spirit of mercy and forgiveness. Lord Jesus, you are the light of peace. Lord, have mercy. You are the light of joy. Christ, have mercy. You are the light of love. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Let us sing the praises of our God. Praise you. 
Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, direct our actions according to your good pleasure, that in the name of your beloved Son we may abound in good works. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Nehemiah. Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which consisted of men, women, and those children old enough to understand. Standing at one end of the open place that was before the water gate, he read out of the book from daybreak till midday. In the presence of the men, the women, and those children, old enough to understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that had been made for the occasion. He opened the scroll so that all the people might see it for he was standing higher up than any of the people. And as he opened it, all the people rose. Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people, their hands raised high, answered, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and prostrated themselves before the Lord, their faces to the ground. Ezra read plainly from the book of the law of God, interpreting it so that all could understand what was read. Then Nehemiah, that is, his excellency and Ezra, the priest scribe, and the Levites, who were instructing the people, said to all the people, Today is holy to the Lord your God. 
Do not be sad. Do not weep. For all the people were weeping as they heard the words of the law. He said further, go, eat rich foods, drink sweet drinks, and allot portions to those who had nothing prepared. For today is holy to our Lord. Do not be saddened this day. For rejoicing in the Lord must be your strength. The word of the Lord. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. As a body is one, though it has many parts, and all the parts of the body, though many, are one body, so also Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free persons, and we were all given to drink of one spirit. Now the body is not a single part, but many. If a foot should say, 
Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body. It does not, for this reason, belong any less to the body. Or if an ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body. It does not, for this reason, belong any less to the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God placed the parts, each one of them in the body as he intended. If they were all one part, where would the body be? But as it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I do not need you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I do not need you. Indeed, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are all the more necessary. And those parts of the body that we consider less honorable, we surround with greater honor. And our less presentable parts are treated with greater propriety. Whereas our more presentable parts do not need this. But God has so constructed the body as to give greater honor to a part that is without it. So that there may be no division in the body, but that the parts may have the same concern for one another. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. If one part is honored, all the parts share its joy. Now, you are God's Christ's body, and individually parts of it. Some people God has designated in the church to be first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then mighty deeds, then gifts of healing, assistance, administration, and varieties of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work mighty deeds? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? The word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Since many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as those 
who were eyewitnesses from the beginning and ministers of the word have handed them down to us, I too have decided after investigating everything accurately anew to write it down in an orderly sequence for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may realize the certainty of the teachings that you have all received. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news of him spread throughout the whole region. He taught in their synagogues and was praised by all. He came to Nazareth where he had grown up and went to his custom into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He stood up to read and was handed the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Jesus unrolled the scroll and found the passage where it, what, it, where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring glad tidings to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim a year acceptable to the Lord. Rolling up the scroll, he handed it back to the attendant and then sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue looked intently at Jesus. And he said to them, Today, this scripture passage is fulfilled in your hearing. The Gospel of the Lord. Once again, a welcome to all. We have a few visitors from St. Vincent's and St. Josephette's in our RCIA um, program. They are looking to be baptized or received to full communion with the Catholic Church. So we have catechumens, a few, and candidates. So welcome to all of you and to all who are watching through live stream. Welcome everyone to this liturgy of unveiling the identity of Jesus. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, when the Spirit claims you and empowers you, the gospel can finally be proclaimed. Only when you're filled with the Spirit. When you're filled with that Spirit, those eight beatitudes that frame our sanctuary, they come alive. The four women who face the world are the leaders of our parish. They're leading us out into the world, grounded here, grounded in what we are about here. But the scroll has been unrolled, the scroll of the Word, the scroll of the Eucharist is unrolled before us. We're all called to be a part of something larger than ourselves, the kingdom. In the voices of those four women, of Mary, Elizabeth, Agnes, and of course, our leader, Teresa of Avila, are beckoning us, ground in this gospel, and ground in the spirit of Christ, to be filled with the spirit, to stand grounded in that spirit, and to recognize in the body of the parish of the church many, many different gifts, and to elevate those people who are pushed to the sides, to elevate them, to give them honor, to give them recognition. Those people who are nameless in our culture, who are homeless, who have no voice, and they are the multitudes. And those of us who are secure in our foundations 
in our lives and have multiple resources, we are to push the light on others, following those four women into the world. And so we gather on this Sunday, Jesus is coming out, so to speak. He is coming out to the people and to us. This is fulfilled. The Spirit of the Lord is upon you to leave with those four voices into the world, proclaiming, what does he say? Glad tidings to the poor, liberty to those who are captive, sight to the blind and to those who are oppressed, freedom. The whole purpose and mission of every parish and every disciple of Jesus, who was a missionary disciple, is to come out of ourselves, ground in the spirit and our beautiful Catholic faith, but to leave the church and go into the world and to reach those who are on the fringes. So it's with great honor that I introduce one more ministry that's going to help us do exactly what Jesus did in the synagogue, to be rooted and grounded in that spirit. I proclaim as simply a leader, one amongst many, a beautiful, beautiful new ministry that will help us to not contain the gospel in these four walls, but to move it out, to touch those who have been enclosed and those people who are going to eventually come out of an enclosure, a prison, and to enter life. And we stand as disciples with them, next to them, shoulder to shoulder. We stand with them. We lead them and, lay, and they lead us into those beatitude living. So I am honored to introduce a visual of this beautiful ministry. Thank God for our screens. If you look intently at the screens, you will see what we are about to embark on. My name is Chris Hoke, and I'm the executive director and founder of Underground Ministries. Through One Parish, One Prisoner, we're now mobilizing faith communities to do exactly what we do, which is relationship. I would invite churches to be a part of this program, not so they can do some kind of neat ministry where they'll get to bless others, but because it'll be transformative for them. They will look at people with different eyes. They will have their hearts expanded for folk who they used to judge. They will be able to walk in the world in a different way with less fear, with more grace, with less judgment, with more hope. Our team had an orientation where we got to know a little bit about the program and what it might look like. We talked about the pattern of death and resurrection in the world and what that might look like for someone who has been incarcerated. And then we got to know our inmate, whose name is Wally. I'm sitting in my prison cell and I'm just thinking like, when I get out, what am I gonna do? Where, where am I gonna go? Where am I gonna live? What job am I gonna have? The last two times when I got out, I didn't have like no support, no nothing, so I'll just go back to what I know. And if you have the support of a, of a church that's connected with you and just for you, you know, and supporting you and lifting you up and being there for you, you know what I mean, that, that's awesome. You can't, you, you can't say no to that. What, what do you got to lose? We got going with writing letters with Wally, and so we've built relationships over time. He knows our kids' names, we know his kids' names, we, he knows what's going on in our lives, we know what's going on in his, and it became, it's become a relationship now. When we started writing letters, I just decided I would put it all out there. This is me. I've had a history of depression and suicide. I deal with anxiety and panic attacks. I don't always feel like I belong um, and I'm working through stuff and I don't have any answers for you, but I'm here and I'm a good listener. It doesn't feel like he's our project. It feels like we're on a team with him and it feels like it's, it's something that we're doing together. And that's a really beautiful thing.
Our One Parish, One Prisoner program guides your OPOP team, five to seven members of your congregation, through a one to two year journey of relationship, through prison letters, calls, visits, the whole time building trust, building friendships, and building a release plan together, where your team can accompany your releasing friend through their early months of reentry into the community together. All this follows our 24 monthly learning modules that covers everything from how do you write your first letter? How do you build trust? How do we share a mutual process of storytelling? Opening conversations about realities like mental health and addiction that affect us all. Even introducing some contemplative prayer exercises. Our modules also will walk your team through things that are maybe more foreign, such as legal financial debt and many of the barriers to re-entry facing so many returning citizens. Your team can learn about this together, and we even walk you through how to involve your wider congregation for a deeper process of education, discipleship, and mobilization. So after being released from prison, I was already transitioning myself. So when I found out that there was a group of people with one parish, one prisoner, that was going to be sponsoring my brother as a, as a support group to give him an opportunity to transition successfully, it, you know, I was amazed. Honestly, I was, I was very happy for him because I know how hard it is to transition on your own. Sometimes at churches and in communities and in schools and all over the place, there's this sense that, you know, there's so many of us, somebody will step up and do that. But when we have this concentrated team, we really have a sense of responsibility so that we're not gonna leave him hanging. And then the rest of the congregation, whatever they wanna do to help, great, fantastic. They can ebb and flow in. But for us and our team, it's, it's, it feels more like a structure of support that is more immovable. I think that the reason people were drawn to the One Parish, One Prisoner program was because it feels really hopeless and helpless when you see the number of incarcerated folk and when you see people coming out of prison and then bouncing right back in. And the idea that we might be able to intercept that and change that tide in some way, shape, or form, just being human with these people who've been incarcerated, the thought of being a part of that was really compelling and exciting to people. As we tell churches in our One Parish, One Prisoner program, this is not about changing what someone believes coming out of prison, but this is an opportunity to go deeper into and experience what we ourselves believe. I was really nervous, really, really nervous after almost seven years in there locked up, you know, not seeing the streets, you know, being free. Knowing I had a release plan with these people, it was like, it was awesome because I know I couldn't like trust in them. If every church did this and they were open to supporting an inmate that's about to transition, it can change a lot in the community. It, it can start a ripple effect that can become a huge wave in society. The goal isn't to get someone to come to your church when they come out of prison, but this is an opportunity for us to be the church to somebody and to roll away the stone, to practice resurrection, and to maybe experience and see the glory of God. throughout and through this beautiful ministry, we're not called to fix someone or to save someone. The most beautiful witness I heard on, at the video was the young woman who spoke about her anxiety and depression. We are all vulnerable. We all need to be saved, especially those of us who are quite comfortable and we need to learn from those who are coming out, so to speak. They have much to teach us about life and about so much that we take for granted. So I'd like to introduce someone who will further explain 
the ministry. Um, I've been in touch with Emily, and she's done a wonderful job welcoming me through her own um, texts and emails, and she'll further explain kind of the nitty-gritty of this beautiful ministry. And this is Emily from You Explain It. Good morning. Good morning. Wow. The first time I watched this video, I remember thinking, this program got it right on. To see that relationship is at the center of this ministry. At a time when we see violence in the headlines every day, choosing to step into the messiness of individuals who have been involved in the criminal justice system. It was an easy decision for us at Colby House to explore bringing this program to Chicago. And the folks at Underground Ministries, as well as our staff at Colby House, are so excited to be working together to launch One Parish, One Prisoner with two local parishes, your neighbor, Immaculate Conception St. Joseph, and here at St. Teresa of Avila. OPOP, as the program is referred to by its initials, OPOP, -OP, is a chance to not only respond to our call to visit Jesus in prison, but also to participate in a process of resurrection, as we saw in the video, for someone in our community who has served his or her sentence and is ready to start anew. The next step for this parish is to form a core team of individuals who will commit to walking this journey together over the next two years. Before we get there, we want to give you the opportunity to learn more to ask questions and to hear exactly what that journey would entail. So we invite you today to sign up for one of two info sessions coming up in the next week on Zoom. We will join parishioners from ICSJ to get a very clear understanding of what comes next. If this video stirred your heart at all, I encourage you to sign up for the info sessions and just come and learn more. There will be plenty of time to discern if the ministry is a good fit for you right now. And the whole parish will be part of the process as it moves along. The first session will take place this Tuesday at 7 p.m. I got three kids, so I'm, it's totally <laughs> fine. <laughs> Been there, done that. The first section will place, take place this Tuesday at 7 p.m. on Zoom, and the second will be next Sunday at 4 p.m. Um, our volunteer, Pat, and I will be available in the entryway over here at the end of Mass, so you can come and sign up, or you can see the website and, and go there and, and, and sign up yourself. If you'd like to watch the video again or share it with others, you can do that too. And there should be a link in, an, in a bulletin insert or and on the parish website. Um, if it's not in there yet, it will be this week, so you can watch for that. The Holy Spirit is already working in this community in so many ways and giving you a heart for those in need. So may the same Spirit continue to move us forward as we embark on this journey of one parish, one prisoner. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Thank you so much for your witness for the beautiful vid video, and I pray as we embark on this beautiful ministry that as I put together basically a team of four or five or six parishioners, we will kind of lead the effort. We might have 40 or 50 people volunteering, but it'll be a core group of people working with me to make sure it's done um, in an orderly and beautiful fashion for the person who is, who is coming out into the world. So thank you, Emily, for a beautiful, beautiful uh, witness. Um, so please stand. I believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things are made. For us, for our salvation, he came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. 
For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds in the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken to the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. I look forward to the resurrection of the dead. I was asked to know the Lord's kindness and faithfulness in answer to these prayers. For the unity of the Holy Church of God and for the well-being of the human family, we pray to the Lord. For, building, for the building of a more humane world and for respect for all human life at all its stages, we pray to the Lord. For the elimination of disease, famine, and war, for the reconciliation of states and peoples and nations, we pray to the Lord that we, throughout our ministries, may hear the voice of the voiceless, those who are in prison, those who are pushed to the fringes of our world, the elderly, those who suffer from all sorts of illnesses, those who suffer injustice, and the unborn, we pray to the Lord. For the consolation of the dying and for the eternal happiness of those who have died, we pray to the Lord that we may learn to cherish and respect all of God's creation by consuming less, recycling, and doing whatever we can to care for the land, the water, and the air. We pray to the Lord. We pray for Josefina Gomez and for Raul Roberto Montes. We pray to the Lord. We also pray for all the victims of gun violence in the city of Chicago. Tamika Talbert, Jamie Davis, Caleb Westbrook, and Lakshman Menem Neal, we pray to the Lord. And we pray for all who are in special need of our prayers, for those whom we promise to pray, and those we pause to remember in the silence of our hearts. Loving God, the same spirit that filled your son as he unrolled the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, that same spirit fills us. That spirit was given to us in our baptisms and through baptism, is ultimately the power of the church. May that spirit guide us out of this church to hear the voices of those who need help, guidance, love, and prayer. And we offer these prayers through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated as we prepare the altar for the Eucharist.
pray, my friends, our sacrifice may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Accept our offerings, O Lord, we pray, and in sanctifying them, grant that they may profit us for salvation through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just and in salvation to give you thanks, Lord God. For in you we live, we move, and have our being. And while in this body we not only experience the daily effects of your love and your care, but even now possess the pledge of life eternal. For having received the first fruits of the Holy Spirit, through whom you raised up Jesus from the dead, we hope for an everlasting share in his paschal mystery. So the angels, the archangels, we praise you as without end we sing. Indeed, holy, O Lord, you are the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Holy Spirit upon them like the dewfold they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed, he entered willingly into his passion. He took bread, giving thanks, broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, eat of it, for this is my body which will be given up for you. When the supper was done, he took the chalice, giving thanks, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection. We offer you, Lord, the bread of life, this chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you've held all of us worthy to stand in your presence and to serve you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Spirit in union with Francis, our Pope, Blaise, our Bishop, and all the men and women who serve and lead our church. Remember those who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and those who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face, together with the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Mother of God and our Mother, with St. Joseph, Teresa of Avila, and all the saints that please you throughout the ages. We may merit to be co-heirs who eternal life and may praise you and glorify you through your Son, Jesus, who is the Christ. Through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. rise with the risen Lord. And we, though many, with many gifts and resources and talents, we are one body, one Christ, and we pray. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us, all we pray, from all that is evil. Graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy we may be free from sin and safe from all fear as we await the blessed hope and coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, peace, I give you my peace, I give you look not on our sins and the faith of your beautiful people, the church, and graciously grant our parish peace and unity in accordance with your will who live and reign forever and ever. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us share the peace of Christ. Peace be with you. Peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy you should enter into my room, but only say the word. May the body and blood of Christ strengthen all of us to help the poor. Amen.
volunteers. The food pantry is volunteers for Saturday mornings from 9 a.m. to 11.45 a.m. Please see the bulletin for more information. Let us pray. Grant, we pray, almighty God, that receiving the grace by which you bring us new life, that we may always glory in this beautiful gift through Christ our Lord. A reminder that um, Emily and Pat will be in the gathering space. For anyone who's interested in signing up, they'll be out there to welcome you, to greet you, and answer any of your questions. The Lord be with you. May God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Mass, and we go in peace to serve the poor. Searching all over the land. He calls the young, the old, the woman and man. The fear of God is enduring and pure. The love of God, eternal and sure. Great in power and wonderful. And we cry,
My name is Chris Hoke, and I'm the executive director.
Good afternoon. Well, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us uh, at St. Teresa of Avila Parish on this, the third Sunday in Ordinary Time. Um, we invite you now to stand and join in singing our opening song, All Are Welcome, All Belong. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, the Lord be with you. Welcome, welcome to all as we pray as a church, the body of Christ. We, though men, are many with many gifts and talents. We are one. And we gather together as the church. As we prepare to listen to the beautiful word, let us ask God to open our hearts that our hearts may be filled with the power of his spirit. Lord have, mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us our sins and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. And let us sing the praises of our God. God in the heart. 
take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us. Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, direct our actions according to your good pleasure, that in the name of your beloved Son we may abound in good works. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. A reading from the book of Nehemiah. Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly, which consisted of men, women, and those children old enough to understand. Standing at one end of the open place that was before the water gate, he read out of the book from daybreak till midday in the presence of the men, the women, and those children old enough to understand. And all people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that had been made for the occasion. He opened the scroll so that all people might see it, for he was standing higher up than any of the people. And as he opened it, all the people rose. Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people, their hands raised high, answered, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and prostrated themselves before the Lord, their faces to the ground. Ezra read plainly from the book of the law of God, interpreting it so that all could understand what was read. Then Nehemiah, that is, his Excellency, and Ezra the priest scribe, and the Levites who were instructing the people, said to all of the people, Today is holy to the Lord your God. Do not be sad and do not weep. For all the people were weeping as they heard the words of the law. He said further, Go. Eat rich foods and drink sweet drinks, and allot portions to those who had nothing prepared. For today is holy to our Lord. Do not be saddened by this day, for rejoicing in the Lord must be your strength.
The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, as a body is one, though it has many parts, and all the parts of the body, though many, are one body, so also Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free persons and we were all given to drink of one spirit. Now the body is not a single part, but many. If a foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it does not for this reason belong any less to the body. Or if an ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it does not for this reason belong any less to the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God placed the parts, each one of them, in the body as he intended. If they were all one part, where would the body be? But as it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I do not need you, nor again the head to the feet, I do not need you. Instead, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are all the more necessary, and those parts of the body that we consider less honorable, we surround with greater honor. And our less presentable parts are treated with greater propriety, whereas our more presentable parts do not need this. But God has so constructed the body as to give greater honor to a part that is without it, so that there may, may be no division in the body but that the parts may have the same concern for one another. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. If one part is honored, all the parts share its joy. Now, you are Christ's body, and individually parts of it. Some people God has designated in the church, 
to be first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then mighty deeds, then gifts of healing, assistance, administration, and varieties of tongues. <clears throat> Are all apostles? <clears throat> Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work mighty deeds? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? The word of the Lord. Thanks be, Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news of him spread throughout the whole region. He taught in their synagogues and was praised by all. He came to Nazareth where he had grown up and went according to his custom into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He stood up to read and was handed a scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the passage where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring glad tidings to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free and to proclaim a year acceptable to the Lord. Rolling up the scroll, he handed it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue looked intently at Jesus. And he said to them, Today, this scripture passage is fulfilled in your hearing. The Gospel of the Lord. Thank you for coming on this actually beautiful day now with the sun shining and the snow, the bright snow. We are 35 strong in the church today, so that's saying something. We're 35 strong, so thank you for being here. And I love the view, as you remember, those of you who are, have been here for a long time, you remember that was all a brick wall seven years ago. We opened the wall, we renovated the church, and we put those windows so that the liturgy could be more connected with the world. And those women, they don't face us. In most Catholic church, all Catholic churches, I think, the windows face this way. <laughs> we decided purposefully to make the women face that way so in a sense, we are looking through their eyes into the world. So that's the focus eventually of this here. And so when Jesus goes to the synagogue, he is literally giving his first indication of who he is and what he's about. He's about moving this or the movement from this into where those women are looking. He unrolls the prophet Isaiah. Everyone's looking at him. They've been waiting for centuries, thousands of years. He said, well, this is it. I'm it. <laughs> the passage of the anointed when the Messiah, it's fulfilled. I'm here. 
Well, as soon as he said that, he got in lots of trouble <laughs> because he wasn't quite living in or leading in a way they thought that he should lead or live. They thought he would liberate the captives, them, by vanquishing the Romans, and he didn't. His gospel, the Beatitudes, that's the foundation of his ministry as the Messiah, is to root us in the world, to become a light for the world, so that we become the fulfillment of scriptures by leaving the church, going in the direction the women are leading us in the world, so that we can be instruments of recovery of sight to those who are blind, particularly blind spiritually, emotionally, politically. We are called to leave here and to help those who are bound, who are captive through fear and through hypocrisy, through whatever it is that's binding them. So we are the fulfillment because we are a Christ for the world. So our lives are supposed to be rooted in those eight Beatitudes, rooted in the prophet Isaiah and in the Word, body and blood, so that we don't spend too much time in this church. We leave and go into the wider body of Christ, people, the church, in the world, and we live out the gospel we just pray. So with that in mind, we've been talking about this for a while, for a couple of months about a new ministry that's going to help us root us in the world and connect us to people who are trying to make a transition in their lives. We are going to connect ourselves with a beautiful ministry as we accompany people who are leaving prison and entering the world. Those four women, the Blessed Mother, Elizabeth of Hungary with the food in the folds of her garment, Agnes, the Lamb of God, she gave her life. And of course, our patron, Teresa of Avila, who leads us, who is the guide, the guide of prayer, the doctor of the church, the, the, the greatest, one of the greatest theologians in the Catholic Church, right there. They're leading us out into the world, rooted in that gospel. And now we're about to embark on another ministry, thanks be to God, a ministry of outreach to those who are making the transition from being enclosed in the prison to the world. With that in mind, I ask you to look at the screens and watch a beautiful video of this ministry. 